Welcome to Redeemer Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Griebel, and this video is part eight of a Bible study entitled From Abraham to Ahijah, a look at some of the non-writing Old Testament prophets. We'll explain what I mean by that in just a little bit. First, we get to our opening hymn, Come Follow Me, the Savior Spake. your spake all in my way abiding deny yourselves the world forsake obey my call and guiding oh bear the cross whatever be tied take my example for your guide i am the light i light the way a godly life displaying i bid you walk as in the day i keep your feet from straying i am the way and i will show how you must sojourn here below my heart abounds in lowliness my soul with love is glowing and gracious words my lips express with meekness overflowing my heart my mind my strength my all to god i yield on him i call i teach you how to shun and flee what harms your soul salvation your heart from every guile to free from sin and its temptation i am the refuge of the soul and lead you to your heavenly goal then let us follow christ our lord and take the cross appointed and firmly clinging to his word in suffering be undaunted for those who bear the battle strain the crown of heavenly life obtain and we join in our opening hymn or opening prayer sorry O oh God, you once taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our day by the same Spirit to have a right understanding in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy consolation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, as, as I said at the beginning, this Bible study is about the non-writing prophets of the Old Testament, namely the prophets who prophesied and were active and prophesied, but they didn't have a book of the Bible named after them, as were the 16 prophets that did get books of the Bible named after them. These are the prophets who prophesied, but they didn't end up with a book of the Bible named after them, so I call them the non-writing prophets. We've looked at several so far, and now we get to one of the greatest of the non-writing prophets, Elijah. 
And so we're going to take several weeks to look at Elijah. So this is Elijah part one. A little bit of background of what we're going to cover today. First of all, King Ahab was one of the most wicked kings of Israel. And Elijah was one of the most powerful prophets from the Bible. And the two of them combined to bring us some of the most interesting stories in the Bible, as we shall see. And the first one we're going to look at comes from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 through 16. Again, if you have your Bible handy, go ahead and turn to that passage in your Bible, 1 Kings chapter 17. This first section we're going to look at is verses 1 through 16. All right. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, Depart from here and turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, as I, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him meat, brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And after a while the brook dried up, because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first make me a little cake of it, and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. So that's our introduction to the prophet Elijah. Let's look at some specific passages and discuss this passage. What do we know about Elijah? As with many of the prophets, we are given very little information about their background. All we are told is that he is from Tishbe in Gilead. So, as I said, there's many prophets in the Old Testament, but typically we're not told much about their background. With the other people in the Old Testament, the kings and the patriarchs, we know all about their background and their genealogy going back many generations, but typically with the prophets, we're really not told much about them at all. Maybe who their father was, maybe a little bit about where they were from, and that the same is true with Elijah here. We know he's from Tishbe. So they called him the Tishbite from Gilead. That's all we know. Don't even know his parents' name or anything more about him. How did God try to get Ahab's attention? As we read, Elijah was sent to him and said, there's not going to be any rain. There's going to be a drought across the whole land. And this was because, of course, Ahab was such a wicked king. God wanted him to change his ways, so he decided to send a drought. How did God care for Elijah then during the drought? Initially, Elijah drank from the brook Cherith and was fed by ravens. Now that must have been quite the deal. So 
He told Elijah where to go to this brook so he would have water to drink and then he would be fed by the ravens. As it says, the ravens then brought him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen birds feed their children. That's what comes to my mind when you have birds feeding Elijah. It's not a real pretty sight. They pick up the food in their beaks and then they bring it to their children, to their babies in the nest and literally stick it down into their mouths and they eat it. And in some cases with some birds, the parents actually uh, eat the food and then regurgitate in it into their children's mouths. I don't know if that's what happened with Elijah or what, but the birds, the ravens, God commanded the ravens to bring him food. And then as we read that the brook eventually dried up and so then God sent Elijah to a widow in the town of Zarephath and she fed Elijah. So Elijah goes to Zarephath and he meets this widow there and the question there is how desperate was the situation of the widow in Zarephath as she tells Elijah first Elijah says bring me some water so she goes to get him the water and as she's going to get the water he says and bring me a little bread to eat and that's when she explains her situation I'm just out here gathering some sticks so that I can go home and bake some bread with some, all the flour and oil that I have left and my son and I can eat it and then basically we're going to die because we have nothing else. That's how desperate their situation was. When Elijah met her, she was gathering sticks to use to cook the last meal for her and her son. And so why do you suppose the widow of Zarephath did what Elijah asked her to? So Elijah says, no, before you take care of yourself and your son, take care of me. In other words, he says, first, make me some bread and bring me some bread. I'm this total stranger who just walked up to you and uh, make me some bread first and then you can take care of yourself. And the widow did it. Why do you suppose she did it? Well, she must have had some reason to trust what Elijah said. And um, as it says in the, the uh, scripture that we read, God tells Elijah, go to Zarephath, because I have commanded a widow there to take care of you. So somehow God had talked to this widow and said, there's going to be this prophet showing up and I want you to take care of him. And so that's how probably how the widow knew then, oh, well, I better do what this prophet says, even though he wants me to feed him first before my own son. She was willing to do that. Then again, she had really no choice. She, as she said, she was making her final meal and the, the plan was to die. So she didn't have much choice in the matter. Have you ever witnessed a situation similar to what the widow did? Well, I can't think of any specific examples, but it is not that unusual. When people act in faith, especially when they give generously, put others before themselves, their generosity is often rewarded by the Lord. And so, and it is definitely a very generous thing to do. Put other people first. We are told to do that time and again in the Bible. Put others before ourselves and God will reward us for doing so. That is certainly the case with the widow of Zarephath. She did what Elijah asked her to do. She fed him first before she fed herself and her son and God blessed her for it. How was the widow's faith and generosity rewarded? God blessed the widow and her son with enough food to make it through the famine. They made it through just fine. And then how does the story of the widow of Zarephath come up in Jesus' ministry? So there's a lot of things that happen in the Old Testament that are never mentioned in the New Testament, but this happens to be one that was mentioned by Jesus in the New Testament. So we're going to read from Luke chapter 4, verses 23 to 26. Jesus said, now Jesus here is in his hometown of Nazareth. So he has started his ministry. He has started to gain attention and has been doing some pretty miraculous things. And then he goes home to his home congregation, his home people. And that's where we pick it up here in Luke 4. He says to the people of Nazareth, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard that you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. 
And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And so when the people of Jesus' hometown saw Jesus, came came to their hometown, to their synagogue, they expected him to do a miracle in their midst. Jesus referred to this story to show that we should not expect special treatment from God just because we are his followers. So the people of Nazareth, they thought, we know this Jesus guy. He grew up here. Now he's going out and doing all kinds of miracles in Capernaum and other places. Now he's come home. Let's have him do some miracles here. And they were being presumptuous just expecting that Jesus would do what they wanted him to do. And so then he goes ahead and quotes this story of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. And as he points out, there were many widows in Israel, and God could have sent Elijah to any of those widows and helped out those widows, but he didn't. Instead, he sends Elijah to a foreign country, to, the land, to Zarephath, which was in Sidon, which was not part of Israel, and blessed that widow through Elijah and took care of her. And so Jesus uses that then as a lesson to all of us. Don't presume just because you're God's chosen people or you're a follower of God that he's going to shower his blessings upon you just because you're his follower. Don't presume anything when it comes to the Lord. He does what he wants to do. And we are to follow him and follow his ways and he will reward us according to his plan and according to his purpose for our lives. So that's the first story we look at with Elijah. And now we're just going to continue here in 1 Kings chapter 17, looking at the next several verses, verses 17 to 24. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took, her from his, and he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Okay. So this widow helps out Elijah. They're doing fine. All of a sudden, her son becomes ill, stops breathing, and he's basically dead. What was the widow's reaction when her son fell ill? She thought she was being punished for a sin that she had committed. And oh my goodness, what a common thought this is. It was very common throughout the Bible. People thought that if your child gets sick, the reason for that illness is because something the parents did. And God, even though God says time and time again, each person will perish or be punished or whatever, have to deal and be held accountable for their own sins, very common belief, misbelief, in fact, that if your child gets sick, it's something you have done that is wrong. And so that's what this woman thought. She said, I'm being punished for some sin that I committed. That's why my son is sick. So then how did Elijah restore the boy's life? He prayed and stretched himself out on the boy three times. He took the boy from his mother, took him up to the upper part of the house where he was staying. He got down on his knees and prayed to God. And then he stretched himself out on the boy three times, praying, Oh Lord, 
Let this boy's life return to him. And the boy's life returned to him. And so this is a reminder again of these prophets, you know, could do some pretty remarkable things. These non-writing prophets, they are, their name didn't get, they get, didn't get a book of the Bible named after them, but they nevertheless did some pretty remarkable things. They were truly prophets sent from God. And that was the widow's response when Elijah restored the life of her son. She knew then for sure that Elijah was a man of God and that the word of God in his mouth, mouth was the truth. Of course, she had already, already seen how um, Elijah had provided her with food for her and her son and her household. Uh, but now by raising her son from the dead, this was even further proof to her that Elijah was a man of God and that the word of God in his mouth was the truth. She could believe what Elijah said. All right, so that's our first look at one of the greatest of the non-writing prophets, Elijah. And we'll keep going with another segment next time. In the meantime, please be sure to like this video and share it on YouTube. We would appreciate that greatly. We conclude then with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.